Hello, and welcome to the Universal Design for Learning class. In a previous class, you consented to be a part of this a study looking at how pre-service teachers get more prepared to enter in the classroom. As a part of that study, you have been chosen to be a part of the lecture condition. This is an introductory PowerPoint presentation. It's intended to help you gain an understanding of universal design for learning. If you are unfamiliar with universal design for learning, this should be an opportunity to deepen and broaden your understanding. If you know about UDL already, it's a good time to review what you know. At the end of this presentation, you will be familiar with universal design for learning and be able to identify UDL when you see it. Most importantly, you'll be able to use the UDL framework the next time you plan an instruction. UDL is related to many educational practices that came before it, but it also has its roots in the worlds of architecture and project design. Things like curb cutouts and easy to read signage are examples of universal design, which is design meant to be accessible to everyone, including users with disabilities. Implementers of UDL have found that when they make the curriculum more accessible to everyone, everyone benefits. This is a video by Todd Rose. Can you think about ways that you can design to the edges like he speaks about? The UDL framework is based on learner variability, which is a scientifically validated construct. We all use different parts of our brains to do all kinds of things. No learner is exactly like another learner. This slide shows how even the simplest task is processed in different parts of our brain. In the slide, you will see three people. Each person was asked to do the same task, tap their fingers. You'll notice by the MRI scans that different people's brains light up in different areas. This is like everything else humans do. UDL uses two different types of brain research as its basis. There is research on learner variability, learner differences, which was on the previous slide. Learner variability showed us, shows us that no two people learn in the same exact way. The second type of brain research that UDL is based on is research about the three different networks that we know exist in our brain. All three of these networks need to be engaged for high quality learning to happen. The UDL framework attempts to give teachers tools to make sure all three of these networks are engaged with all learners. The first network is the effective network. This is the why of learning. When we engage the, effective learn the affective network, we're thinking about how learners are engaged and stay motivated, how they're challenged or excited. The purpose of the effective ne network is to stimulate interest and motivate learning. And the se second network is the recognition network, the what of learning. Here's where we gather facts and categor categorize what we see and hear. We identify letters and words, we're strategic. In this network, we're thinking about how can we present information in, in consistent ways. The third network is the strategic network, the how of learning. This is the part of our brain that is planning and sequential. It looks for ways to organize and express our ideas. Writing an essay or solving a math problem, those are all strategic tasks. When we look at designing for the strategic network, we're looking at ways to differentiate the ways that students can express what they know. These are the three major principles of UDL, and they are based on the idea that every learner is different 
and the three neural networks affect learning. The UDL framework is structured entirely around this scientifically validated concept that in order to give every student a chance to achieve at a high level, we must seek to engage them in a variety of ways, that we must offer students a variety of ways to access the materials, and that we must give students the option of how to show us what they're learning. When we talk about universal design for learning, we're talking about multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, and multiple means of action and expression. To really understand UDL, you need to understand the vocabulary that's centered around it. One of the major ideas of UDL is a framework. Universal Design for Learning is a framework. It's not a checklist. It is the interior framework around which you build the structure that will become your lesson. Just like a steel or metal building frame, the UDL framework has been carefully calibrated and tested to ensure that they, it will stand the test of time. Secondly, learning environment. It's a common misconception that UDL is just incorporating technology into instruction. But if the technology options are too prescriptive, then the technology can actually be a hindrance to learning. UDL is about access to a learning environment and to learning to overcome barriers. So the learning environment should be mindfully constructed to be accessible for all students. When we talk about the learning environment, we're talking both about the space in which the lesson takes place, but we're also talking about the lesson itself, the attitude, the feeling that comes out of your classroom. In an ideal scenario, a teacher has the opportunity to tailor the space to meet the needs of the students for each lesson, to provide further access to tools, resources, and strategies for learning. Further, the tools and resources are flexible in a UDL environment, meaning that not every student is going to access the same things in the same way, but the learning environment will provide options for the students. Access. Access is a term we use a lot in UDL, and it refers to the student's ability to access the information both physically and their ability to connect with the information. If a student is to have access, it means they are given a reason to emotionally attach to the lesson. Their background knowledge is activated. They know that they'll have a variety of opportunities to interact with the topic, and they'll have a lot of chances to demonstrate their understanding on the topic. Also, their physical needs are met. Access is another main idea in the UDL framework. Sometimes it's enough to present information in a single way and ask students to respond in a uniform way. Often though, that's not the case. We need to think of individual students and ask ourselves, will this student want to learn about this? Will this student be able to, to learn about it? Will this student be able to show me what she's learned? If the answer to any of those questions is maybe or no, we need to increase access. Barriers. A barrier in a UDL framework is something that inhibits the student's ability to fully engage in a lesson. It can be a physical barrier, like they're unable to read, they're unable to hold a book, they're un unable to sit on the floor, those would all be physical barriers. And maybe a lack of background knowledge. They've never heard of the term. They don't understand the concept. In their culture, this is something that's foreign. It could be difficulties to learning. Barriers might be specific disabilities. Or it could be difficulties regarding emotionally connecting with the lesson or the instructor. If a student doesn't like where they're at, the student finds the instructor challenging, it's gonna be a barrier in their learning environment. Everybody has barriers to their learning, even our best learners. Some barriers, like being hungry, UDL can't fix that. 
But most academic barriers, like poor writing skills, a small vocabulary base, or difficulty with number fluency, can be mediated by providing multiple means of engagement, representation, or action and expression. All students are valued and can succeed in a UDL classroom, meaning everybody can work towards mastery. The primary purpose of UDL is to break down the barriers to learning. If the learning barriers are removed, all students can learn and be successful, and so can the teachers. Barriers are the things that keep students from succeeding, and the goal of using the UDL framework is to mitigate the barriers. Some of you right now are not taking in what we're talking about. You're uncomfortable in your seat. You're worried about something. It's a late night. You don't think you need this information. Maybe you have a hard time reading things off a screen at the front of the room because of eyesight issues, or maybe you're annoyed with the sound of my voice. Maybe I've used words that you don't understand and that you may tune out. Or maybe you've harbored a deep resentment of UDL ever since you first heard about it because it just seems like the same old fad wrapped up in a new name. These are all barriers. In a perfect UDL setting, I would try to address all of them. Of course, I can't address, address all of them, but I'm gonna do my best to minimize the barriers. That's why we're going over vocabulary. That's why there's a video at the beginning that's meant to get you emotionally invested in UDL. In a classroom setting, you may have a student who has bad handwriting. Do you fight with the student about the handwriting or do you let them do assignments on a computer? Sometimes we have to struggle through a barrier, but sometimes we can just work around them. The UDL framework asks you to put learning at the center of your instruction and keep the barriers as far to the outside as possible. This is a four minute video. It introduces some basic UDL background and ideas. At this point, it might be a little bit of a root view, but it organizes some of what we've talked about in a more formal way. This teacher needs to meet a curriculum goal and she's got a very diverse group of students. And so does this teacher. And this one. Most do. In fact, research shows that the way people learn is as unique as their fingerprints. What does this mean for teachers of today? Classrooms are highly diverse and curriculum needs to be designed from the start to meet this diversity. Universal Design for Learning is an approach to curriculum that minimizes barriers and maximizes learning for all students. Whoa, that's a fancy term. Universal Design for Learning. Let's unpack it a bit. Let's think about the word universal. By universal, we mean curriculum that can be used and understood by everyone. Each learner in a classroom brings her own background, strengths, needs, and interests. Curriculum should provide genuine learning opportunities for each and every student. Now let's think about the word learning. Learning is not one thing. Neuroscience tells us that our brains have three broad networks. One for recognition, the what of learning. One for skills and strategies, the how of learning. And one for caring and prioritizing, the why of learning. Students need to gain knowledge, skills, and enthusiasm for learning, and a curriculum needs to help them do all three. But every learner is unique, and one size does not fit all. So how do we make a curriculum that challenges and engages diverse learners? This is where the word design comes in. A universally designed building is planned to be flexible and to accommodate all kinds of users, with and without disabilities. It turns out that if you design for those in the margins, your building works better for everyone. Curb cuts and ramps are used by people in wheelchairs, people with strollers, and people on bikes. Captioning on TV serves people who are deaf, people learning English, people in gyms, and spouses who get to sleep at different times. UDL takes this idea and applies it to the design of flexible curriculum. 
UDL goes beyond access because we need to build in support and challenge. So how do we use the UDL framework to make learning goals, methods, materials, and assessments that work for everyone? First, ask yourself, what is my goal? What do I want my students to know, do, and care about? Then ask, what barriers in the classroom might interfere with my diverse students reaching these goals? To eliminate the barriers, use the three UDL principles to create flexible paths to learning so that each student can progress. Number one, provide multiple means of representation. Present content and information in multiple media and provide varied supports. Use graphics and animation, highlight the critical features, activate background knowledge, and support vocabulary so that students can acquire the knowledge being taught. Number two, provide multiple means of action and expression. Give students plenty of options for expressing what they know and provide models, feedback, and supports for their different levels of proficiency. Number three, provide multiple means of engagement. What fires up one student won't fire up another. Give students choices to fuel their interests in autonomy. Help them risk mistakes and learn from them. If they love learning, they will persist through challenges. And remember, always keep in mind the learning goal. Get rid of barriers caused by the curriculum and keep the challenge where it belongs. And that's it. Okay, quick recap. Show the information in different ways. Allow your students to approach learning tasks and demonstrate what they know in different ways. And offer options that engage students and keep their interest. Universal design for learning equals learning opportunities for all. For more information on UDL, go to www.cast.org. This slide introduces you to the four curricular pillars of UDL. These are really important for general ed teachers. They're the goals, the instruction, which is sometimes called instructional methods, materials, and assessments. We will address each of these four curricular pillars in the following slides. So let's imagine we're going on a road trip. We have a specific destination in mind. That's our goal. So we plug the destination into our GPS. In a traditional classroom, teachers write prescriptive goals like Students will write a descriptive essay about Greek mythology, which means there is only one way to get there. The student has to write. A goal in a traditional classroom is to get from a starting point to an end point in a single, seemingly efficient way. But what happens if the student hates to write or has a hard time putting thoughts into words or doesn't have a computer with a working keyboard or has fine motor difficulties? difficulties. What happens if the last paper the student wrote was ripped apart by another teacher who is a harsh grader and now the student feels like writing is a surefire way to get demoralized? A GPS can give you one set of directions, but there are various reasons that route might not work. The route might be meant for a car and you want to walk or there may be road construction or an accident, or you may have a passenger who can't go through tunnels. The point is to get to the goal. Even if the way you get there isn't what GPS determined was the most efficient. So what if we run the destination through a UDL algorithm? In this example, the GPS is using the top four squares the four curricular pillars, goals, methods, assessments, and materials, and the bottom row of squares, which represents the big three principles of UDL, multiple means of representation, multiple means of expression, and multiple means of engagement. The UDL classroom teacher writes a goal that will allow students to show what they know in a variety of ways. If the point is to learn about Greek mythology, then the goal should just be about Greek mythology. If the goal is to learn to write, then the goal should be about writing. The UDL classroom offers students and teachers a variety of options so that people can find their own best way. One of the challenges of UDL for educators is learning to trust that the students will get to where you want them to go. 
but well-written goals are the surest way of beginning a successful journey. So what do all of those routes represent? If students aren't writing, how can they demonstrate what they know? Students could use graphic organizers, PowerPoints, videos, handwritten papers, typed papers, diagrams, oral presentations, podcasts, to present all the things that they know. This is how UDL works. We're thinking of goals that are flexible, but gets us to all to the same place. And we're giving students the ability and the confidence to make some decisions on how to best get there. So this second curricular pillar is instruction or methods. These include all the decisions and approaches, procedures and routines that teachers use to enhance learning. Because learners vary in the ways they become and stay motivated to learn, comprehend information, and strategically approach tasks, the UDL framework emphasizes the need to employ many kinds of teaching methods. We all know that there are students who will learn even the, in the absence of instruction. And we all know the students who don't think they can learn no matter how hard you teach. In a classroom where the teacher has used UDL to plan the instruction, the goal is for every kind of learner to have the opportunity to access the information. Sometimes this means the teacher will let the students work in groups, let the students work individually, use a video, use a graph, use virtual manipulatives, use handheld manipulatives. All of those things are instructional methods that help the students learn what they need to learn. Materials. Materials, the stuff of learning. It's the third curricular pillar. When we use materials, we're thinking about, do these materials make sense for this goal? And do they engage the learners in becoming proactive? Materials are everything that you use to teach, and they can be linked to methods. The methods is how you teach. The materials are what you use to teach. It could be books or paper, pens, iPads, apps, post-it notes, music, smart boards, dry erase boards, manipulatives. The key is to give your students access to any tool that can help them be successful. Often people assume that when we talk about materials and UDL together, we're only talking about technological tools. But of course, everything we use in the classroom is a tool for learning. Even the teacher's voice is a material. In an ideal setting, we have everything we need to give our students every opportunity to learn, and we let them use those materials in an open-ended way. Sometimes we can't have everything we think we need, but we can still be creative in the way we use what we have. So take a look at this slide. It's supposed to be a little bit funny and you've probably seen it. I've seen it floating around Facebook. How does this connect to UDL and assessment? You'll notice the different animals and the man is saying, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. And of course, that puts one animal in a clear advantage, while the other animals are wondering, am I really ready to be, do I really know all I need to know? That's the same with assessments. We can assess all the students in a single way. But then we have to ask, are we really assessing what they know? Are we assessing how they can perform on a task? If we open assessments up, give students choices, let them really show what they know in a way that they feel good about, everybody is more successful. 
So this is the expanded version of the principles and guidelines document, and it includes checkpoints. I'll be passing out a handout for you. You can keep it and use it. Earlier, we said that UDL is a framework, not a checklist. This slide, however, makes it look kind of like a checklist. You'll see the principles at the top, multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representation, multiple means of action and expression. These are the terms that we've talked about. And underneath those are guidelines. There are ways to help us think about how we can be more inclusive. So providing options for self-regulation, providing options for sustaining effort and persistence, providing options for recruiting interest. These are all things that we can do and think about to make students be more engaged in what we're teaching. They aren't meant to be used with every learner in every lesson and every day. You're not gonna hit every single one of these boxes. But what UDL asks us to do is to use these proven strategies to reduce the barriers for learning. For example, if engagement is not a barrier for any student in a particular lesson, because the lesson's exciting and students have their own reasons for sustaining their interest, then there isn't any reason to do a lot of extra work to foster engagement. That would be a good opportunity to pay attention to providing multiple means of representation or looking at the action and expression pieces. If students are all able to act and express in the way that we're expected them to, then maybe we don't need to look at those boxes, but maybe the content isn't very interesting. And that's where we need to look at engagement and decide if there's ways that we can help students connect to the content. Representation, again, is how students are getting the information. So can we provide students with different ways to see and hear and experience the content? Underneath each of these guidelines are checkpoints. And the checkpoints help teachers to understand what the guidelines are really talking about. They help us think of the major things that really fall by the wayside and help us think through what we're doing to make sure we're making good classroom decisions. This is the Universal Design for Learning Framework. We've talked about Universal Design for Learning for the past 45 minutes of class. And now it's time for you to show what you know. Thank you for participating in the lecture. Thanks for being active learners. If you have questions, feel free to contact me. I love talking about UDL. Now you're gonna log on to your instructor's Canvas site and you're gonna finish the post-testing materials. They should be familiar with you. They look exactly like the pre-testing materials. You may begin the post-test now.